My name is Laurie Santos, and I'm a professor of psychology at Yale University. I study primates because I'm interested in humans. I want to know what makes humans tick. Um, but if you're really interested in that question, it's actually kind of bad to study humans because they have too much stuff, you know, too much education and culture and all that stuff. So we study primates to kind of strip away all that other stuff and actually look at humans in their more ancestral state, try to get our evolutionary origins. Uh, we study a group of capuchin monkeys on Yale campus that we have in kind of a big zoo enclosure. Um, and that kind of lets us get up close and personal with this group of monkeys. Uh, capuchins are a really cool group of monkeys to work with because they're New World monkeys, so they're really distantly related to us, um, but they're really similar to us in lots of ways. So they're very good at using tools, really complex social relationships. They're just a great model for studying humans. Uh, we, we also work with a group of primates uh, down at a field site in Cayo Santiago, Puerto Rico. So this is a great tropical island right off the coast of Puerto Rico, and it's home to about 1,000 free-ranging monkeys. Um, so this is a wonderful facility because the monkeys range free, you know, they're really in a naturalistic setting, but we can kind of go down there and really study them out there in this awesome setting. Uh, capuchin monkeys are great and sometimes difficult to work with in part because they're so smart. Um, the monkeys we have at Yale we've named after uh, characters in James Bond movies, and those names are especially apt um, because they're quite smart, but that means that a lot of times they're outsmarting me and my students, you know, um, you know breaking apparatuses, stealing things that they're not supposed to have. and um, so it's, it's fun and that they're really smart, but it's also kind of challenging and that they're, they're clever, sometimes more clever than we are. The, the reason a lot of primate researchers actually compare their primate subjects, not with adult humans, but with infant humans, is, is for the following reason. And, and that, that's just that one reason to study primates is they're a great model for humans, minus all kinds of human-specific experiences. You know, so they don't have teaching, they don't have kind of language and that sort of communication system. They also don't have all the kind of technology stuff that we have, iPhones and that sort of thing. Uh, and they never will. Human babies are an, an interesting contrast to that because they lack at least experience with a lot of that stuff. They're too little to have those experiences, but they have a brain and a mind that's set up to eventually get them. You know, so most six-month-old human infants don't know how iPhones work. You know, they haven't had much in the way of you know, the typical Western education system, but they're probably going to get it, or at least they have the capacity to get it. So comparing infants and primates actually lets you say, OK, here we have a mind that's eventually going to get this stuff but hasn't had it yet, and here's a mind that might never get it. What are some of the similarities we see, and what are some of the differences? Uh, well, if you're looking for where, uh, when humans kind of developmentally beat out, you know, the best non-human animal, I think, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very human-centric kind of question, right? We're thinking about, you could ask for each particular ability, you could say, oh, when, for our theory of mind, do we kind of outpace apes and so on? But for general abilities, I mean, I'll never be able to swing from the canopy rainforest in the way that a capuchin monkey does. Um, you know, and if you go beyond primates, I'll never be able to echolocate like a bat and um, so to, to a biologist, even that question might seem like, well, you know, for the stuff we do, great, but, you know, there's a lot of things we can't do that, you know, other species can. So, so it's a tough kind of comparison of, you know, when do we kind of overtake them in the graph? But. So one of the things we're interested in studying the monkeys for is because we want to see, do they have the kinds of cognitive capacities that we have as humans that we're really proud of? And one of these things is, is what we call a theory of mind. Uh, it's a complicated term, but what it really just means is the fact that when we look out in the world and watch human behavior, we don't see just behavior. We see all these things going on inside the head. So we see other people's beliefs, their intentions, their desires. That's how we kind of make sense of the world. It's a hard problem from a psychology perspective because we can't see any of that stuff directly. We're making all these kind of crazy inferences about what's going on in others' heads. So lots of researchers have wondered, do other animals do this? Can they go beyond what they see and actually infer other things? Uh, the way we've tried to get at this uh, is a little bit tricky. We've said, well, what are the contexts in which other species might use a theory of mind if they had them? And the sad thing is that if you think about evolution, usually the way other species might use a theory of mind is actually to outcompete others, to deceive others, to do kind of slightly dastardly things with of what they know about others' beliefs and intentions. Uh, so we set up a big series of studies at the field site to actually see, do the monkeys know when it's a good time to deceive us? In other words, do they pay attention to what we can see and what we know? Uh, so the experiment's pretty simple. We 
uh, set up a human who has some treat that a monkey might like, like a piece of grape, um, and we just vary whether the human can see the grape. You know, so uh, he's either facing it or he's turned around or he's a barrier in front of his face. And what we do is just ask, you know, does a monkey subject try to steal it? And what we find is, surprisingly, the monkeys use pretty much the same cues that humans use to decide when somebody could see them. So they don't steal a grape if somebody's facing forward, but they do if somebody is turned to the side or kind of looking away. Um, so they're, they're very good cheats and, and thieves. Um, but in, in showing that they're good cheats and thieves, we've actually been able to see they have some aspects of our own theory of mind. Yeah, one of the things that, so the, the question of what's uniquely human is actually a big one. Um, and it, you, depending on who you ask, you might get really different answers. If I had to put my money on something that was actually uniquely human, it seems in some funny way to be our motivation to actually interact with others in a funny way. And what I mean by this is that uh, you know, generally if you look at any humans anywhere, if they're hanging out with other humans, they're often doing something where they're showing something to another individual. So you see something cool, you say, oh, hey, look at this cool thing. And to psychologists, this is this process of reference, right? Sort of share, referring to information out there in a the world. And it seems like other primates, even though you think this is kind of a simple ability, they seem to lack at least the motivation to do this. Um, this leads to the fact that they don't have the kind of communication that we have. You know, things like language with nouns that can kind of point to things out there in the world. Um, they also don't seem to share their own desires and intentions with others, um, which leads to a lack of kind of cooperation in a lot of domains. So, so if I had to put my money on what was uniquely human, I'd, I'd go with a kind of motivation to share information with others. Uh, so a, a lot of the work with with primates actually tries to explore all these aspects of human cognition that we're in some sense most proud of, you know, things like a theory of mind and so on. Um, but less work is actually focused on some of these processes that are just universal in humans, um, but are kind of dumb uh, and in some ways really systematically dumb. Um, so we took up the charge of saying, well, you know, are, are any of these kind of dumb biases shared with other primates? Um, and we started in the economic domain in part because you know, this is really a spot where uh, humans can be bad. And, and the fact that we're bad has, ha can have really enormous consequences, such as the current financial collapse and so on. Um, but to do this, to sort of study this question, you know, do monkeys share our economic biases? Um, we had a bit of a challenge because, of course, our monkeys don't actually use money yet. Um, so the first task was actually to uh, introduce a new currency to our monkeys. Uh, we did this by giving them little metal washers and teaching them that they could trade with human experimenters for food. And the amazing thing was that they actually picked this up really quickly. So the monkeys got really flexible with this. And we just then put them in a market. So they got a little wallet of tokens in the morning and they got to go into their enclosure and they had a choice of different experimenters who sold different foods at different prices. And we just said, you know, how do they, how do, they do and how do they compare to humans? And what we found was really striking because in the spots where humans are very rational, where they obey all of the economists' models, the monkeys did the same. Um, so when uh, different goods go on sale, so if apples go on sale today, the monkeys would buy more apples. And they do it in a way that all of the economic math would predict almost perfectly, almost amazingly, even though they had you know, pretty much no experience with the market. The other striking thing was that the monkeys seemed to show exactly the same biases that humans show. And one of the important ones is uh, what's often called loss aversion. Basically, this is the idea that we don't like losing things. And we get more emotional about losing things than we get happy about gaining things. And this can actually lead to a bunch of biases that play out in real markets, like the fact that many people would be better off selling their home at a slight loss than holding on to it while the market kind of careens downward and so on. Um, so our loss aversion plays out in all these ways. We said, you know, are the monkeys loss averse? And the way we looked at this was to present the monkeys with a choice between traders. One trader gave a piece of apple as promised, so he showed the monkey a piece of apple, and then when the monkey paid him, he got that piece of apple. Uh, the other experimenter always showed the monkey two pieces of apple, but when the monkey paid that experimenter, the experimenter only got one. And the idea was, does the monkey take into account what they think they're going to get, or do they just care as they probably should in what they get overall? And what we found is that the monkeys reliably avoid the guy that gives them less than what they expect. 
uh, it seems like they too might be averse to losses, averse to these situations that seem like they're losing out, even though it doesn't actually affect how much food they're getting overall. Uh, the cool thing about all of this is it suggests that many of these biases that play out in the financial crisis might actually be shared with capuchin monkeys, um, which means they might actually be 35 million years old. 